Yep. yep. There Looks we like go. Red. All right. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Garth Ruff, Extension Educator, Agriculture and Natural Resources uh, in Henry County here in Northwest Ohio. Um, Amanda asked me to give a quick livestock market update. Uh, probably not going to be quite as uh, inspiring as what you uh, experienced this morning. Uh, certainly a tough time for our livestock producers here across the state, uh, but maybe we can finish up with a little bit of optimism here on the back end as we go through this. Uh, so just on May 4th here, a couple of days ago, um, you know, subscribed to a lot of newsletter from Ohio Country Journal. Uh, we're comparing to 2019 to 2018. Uh, our cattle and hog sales both uh, were up here in the state. Cattle sales up 8%, hog sales up 1%. Um, so really coming into 2020, things were looking relatively good for our two major uh, livestock industries here in the state uh, with some growth in terms of sales uh, and increases in prices from the previous year. And then as of today, I, I, th I think we got to ask, you know, what year is it? Um, as of yesterday, we had live cattle futures for June, you know, below $90. Uh, August futures in the low 90s. Uh, so I had to actually ask Ben, who's on this call, to pull, to pull back some data. Uh, and we'll show you that in the next slide when the cattle market uh, was last at these points. From the pork side of things, certainly a bigger challenge. Uh, it's an industry that relies on logistics and, and timing. Moving pigs from the sow unit, from the sow unit to our contract finishing system here in the state, and from those barns to the packing plants. And if that doesn't happen in a timely and logistical manner, we get backed up really quick. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. Uh, some of the pictures on the screen, you know, it's gotten to the point where some of our smaller integrators are selling pigs to the public directly from uh, their barns. Um, it made the rounds on Facebook the other day. Uh, on the cattle side of things, you know, our auction markets are, have asked for the first time maybe ever, producers not to bring fed cattle to those auctions. Or the price hasn't been even good enough uh, or to quote here as of late. So looking back historically, when was the last time the, the cattle uh, industry, our beef cattle industry, uh, saw these kind of prices. Um, you know, the last time was, of course, the recession there, 2009 and 10. Um, and we've been, you know, really on trend line up ever since, of course, 2014, 2015, with the low cow herd numbers were the really good years in terms of fed cattle. Uh, and even before that, you know, it's really the BSD case in 2003, December 2003 was the last time we saw cattle futures uh, sustained, you know, at or around that $80 mark. And he, here's kind of the story today. Um, our weekly federal inspected beef, our, our harvest capacity due to challenges with COVID-19 and, you know, certainly we want to keep um, our workers, the workers in the supply chain safe. And that's why these plants have either reduced um, capacity or shut down for a period of time altogether. Um, but we can see that the, the, the pounds of product going through our federal plants um, <clears throat> really throughout the month of April have took a steepest dive, usually that we only see around Christmas, uh, the Christmas and New Year holiday. So here locally in Ohio, we really haven't had a cash market for cattle at the auctions in really a month. Um, that's been similar to our storm milk. We think it's the annual most for Ohio cattle. We uh, have a JBS plant in Southern Pennsylvania, which was really the first one to shut down due to COVID-19. Uh, we think of the Tyson plant in Joslin, Illinois. Um, that's still at greatly reduced capacity. <clears throat> Both those plants are up and running, but for the most part, really focused on cattle that they have contracted with, um, with producers. And then, of course, the JBS Plainwell plant for our dairy beef steers uh, and some call cows uh, really hasn't missed a beat um, here in the last month. 
Uh, there's some news that maybe JBS will be back in the cash market this week. That's certainly good news for those growers that have heavy cattle on hand. Um, you know, we're not sure about Tyson. That plant's a little further west in the country as we've seen the uh, coronavirus move in that direction. Steer harvest weights are up three pounds over a week ago. We think of carcass weights at 889 pounds. Uh, it's got to be pushing an all-time all high. And that's 32 pounds greater than they were a year ago. Partly due to cattle being held on feed for a longer period of time. Uh, and then, of course, the winter of 2018, 2019 was tough on some of those cattle in our plains feed lots. Um, so not all the all that weight gain is due to current conditions. Definitely concerns amongst local feeders or smaller feeders here in Ohio about some of the discounts they're going to see when, when those cash markets open back up due to having cattle that are either too fat as a yield grade four or greater. We see about a $12 discount today for those yield grade four cattle. Uh, and cattle with a heavy carcass weight, uh, about a $15 100 weight discount um, for cattle that fall out of those carcass weight parameters set by those processors. Uh, and that varies from plant to plant. A lot of them are somewhere around 1,050 pounds. Um, USDA, I think, still quotes 900 on some of their daily beef reports. So how do we manage those feedlot cattle during this time of slowdown? Well, uh, it becomes a question that we've gotten quite a bit across the beef team here in Ohio, uh, but it's certainly a challenge. Uh, we still got to maintain about two and a half pounds of average daily gain to retain our quality or the marbling within those cattle. Uh, and on the nutrition side, you know, we won't dive into that much, but that's a minimum of 50 to 55 um, NEG or net energy again on a 100 weight basis. We can get into that and I've got the link there. Um, options to manage those cattle is of course reduce the energy in the diet, uh, pull some of that yellow corn and increase forage in the diet by seven and a half to ten percent. At the most we'd want to feed up to 40 percent corn silage in cattle that have been on a grain diet or up to 15 percent dry hay. For cattle that are you know just entering the feedlot maybe it's reducing the potency of that implant program um, especially for our colored cattle. Uh, maybe skipping that terminal implant altogether as cattle become ready uh, this summer or fall. Or we can limit feed those cattle at 90 percent of their current intake. Uh, you know if we're feeding in a bunk and can do some bunk scoring that's uh, that can be done pretty easy. For utilizing a steer stuffer, uh, that, that certainly becomes a challenge in a self-feeder situation. So as our packers and processors return to the marketplace, you know, I, I typically live by the theory if the cattle are ready, we've got to sell them. But I think we got to have a little bit of strategy um, going back to the market at this time. Sell the most market-ready cattle, any of those yield grade fours or heavies that you know, those extra days on feed are just gonna be a uh, penal penalization economically. We probably don't wanna flood the market early on. You know, if you got cattle that are close, maybe we feed them for another, you know, two weeks, those type of things. Now, I certainly encourage every cattle feeder in the state as we come back, uh, as the plants open back up, to communicate with their order buyer, you know, whether that's the buyer that's coming to the farm and sorting cattle or communicate with their auction market manager ahead of time. Now, all that said, um, Daryl Peel uh, from the Oklahoma State University and the NCBA uh, did a pretty in-depth study to figure out what COVID-19 was going to cost the beef industry. And here I just want to point out their post-COVID price forecast. Now, they did this study in April. Um, but there's certainly some optimism on the back end uh, that maybe by the end of the year we can see cash cattle or future prices um, for cash cattle up into the 120s. I get some questions about call animals. You know, should, should, if we got call cows and bulls, should we sell them? Uh, in the last month, I'd call them slightly lower but steady. Bulk of our cows in Ohio trade in the mid 50s to mid 60s. That's not a whole lot different than uh, pre-COVID-19 because our call plants are operating on six-day weeks above their five-day kill capacity anyway. 
Uh, lean heavy muscle bulls, if you've seen the market reports the last couple of weeks, are probably setting records here across the state due to local demand from our local processors for lean beef. Um, if you've got some thin cows, uh, some fall calving cows that are just weaned and have been on some poor forage over the winter, you know, consider adding condition to those cows if it can be done economically. And then be considering putting energy in the diet, whether it's corn, you know, something like a corn gluten feed or distillers. Um, you know, if you're not a regular buyer of distillers or even a regular buyers, um, some of that product's getting a little tougher to source. Our stalker cattle certainly lower than expected at the beginning of the year, uh, especially those 700 pound plus yearling type calves. Uh, but for the smaller cattle, you know, 550 uh, and down, the available grass has certainly been a plus. Those cattle have sold relatively well here in the state. Uh, you can see here, once again, that study from Daryl Peel at Oklahoma State, the total impact of um, recent events, COVID-19 to the beef industry. You know, we've seen our cow-calf operators over the two-year period you know, somewhere around $247, $250 a head loss. Stalker backgrounders this year, $160, um, and so on. You can, we'll share this. But the total economic impact of COVID-19 on the beef industry is somewhere around uh, That's $1 billion dollars um, as far as, you know, we're talking about really a highly integrated system that at one point lost 40% of their packing capacity. Once again, a lot of timing logistics have made the current situation the challenge as we look at that pig flow. flow. Um, but we're also looking at an industry that, you know, really um, in the last half of 2019, has uh, seen some challenges and operates on relatively low margins to begin with. Uh, there's an article out the other day that the 40 largest swine producers in the country stand to, least, stand to lose somewhere around $18 million uh, each during, during this crisis. Many options being considered as packing capacity is still reduced. We can talk about slowing the growth of pigs. Once again, they're on a self-feeding, highly integrated system. That's certainly a challenge. Uh, we can sell pigs to individuals. We've seen this. I think there's some potential issues in terms of food safety. Uh, we'll sell these animals to individuals, um, and especially now it's the first week of May, and we've got to get those hogs chilled down uh, to 40 degrees or below pretty quick. You know, Kind of on a heavier side, a heavier note, you know, there's aborting sows and humane euthanasia of pigs, whether that's young pigs or, you know, even heavy pigs in some of the, some of these states um, has, has been considered uh, and, and practiced to some extent. The challenge with, um, you know, euthanizing, especially market ready pigs is how do we dispose of those carcasses? Um, do we have enough rendering capacity in the state? Uh, do we have to look at some alternative options, uh, even past composting? Um, farmer stress, certainly a lot of stress in the pork industry. Uh, of course, it's financial, but I think a big mental toll when we stop, talk about those bottom two options um, for, for a community that's, you know, kind of eternal optimist when it comes to producing uh, high quality pork product. Uh, and caring for their animals. On the dairy side of things, uh, of course, Diane Shoemaker, I encourage you to reach out to her if you have any further questions or look at dairy.osu.edu. Uh, but 2019 was supposed to be a good year. Um, really the first good year since 2014. Uh, the back half of 2019, we saw rising milk prices. Of course, a lot of our fluid milk goes through the school systems. Uh, when schools close for the year, well, we're back in kind of familiar territory for the dairy industry. Uh, no prices more complicated uh, than, than I understand. On the dairy, uh, the side of the things that I probably work with the most is what do we do with uh, some of these dairy heifers and crossbreeding dairy cows to beef sires. 
Um, you know, there's certainly potential there to manage our um, glut of heifers here in Ohio. Look at crossbreeding the bottom third of the cow herd uh, at the beef sires uh, and then marketing those um, through a traditional beef uh, market and feedlot system. And really here you can see, um, this is a couple weeks old at this point, um, but really where we've been since the first of the year. Uh, certainly, Ben's gonna talk about grain, but you can certainly see there the livestock um, and the impact um, that recent events have had on the livestock industry. Not a poultry expert, but I think there's some really good information out there. And I really like this chart that really tells the story of supply and demand. You know, when we close our restaurants uh, in our food service industry and we have an oversupply of, uh, of poultry, you can really see what that's done to the price, uh, especially during late March and into April. You know, maybe the highlight, we've got some egg producers here in Northwest Ohio. Uh, and they seem to be doing pretty well. Uh, retail egg purchases from the USDA data, uh, of course, some of that probably due to some panic purchasing, uh, but, but peaked there in late March. And we can see that egg prices have followed. Uh, sheep, our sheep harvest capacity is down 12%. Uh, the second largest sheep processor in the United States filed for bankruptcy uh, there in April. And in a month's time, uh, two minutes, Jared says, um, in a month's time, certainly the greater impact has been to our heavier weight mark lambs and in our age call sheep. Um, slight rebound here in late April. You know, many of those lambs, light lambs that are traditionally sold on Easter market have been retained. What does that look like going in the fall after they've been on feed? Uh, that's a question I'm dealing with at home as we didn't get any lambs sold this spring and made a decision um, that we can feed those out, hopefully uh, to an economic advantage for a late summer fall sale. Maybe one of the highlights in animal agriculture and livestock business has been locally. Our local processors, uh, you know, have really had a heyday as of late. Um, and a lot of new demand in terms of their retail sales you know, when uh, we saw what happened at some of the retail chains, uh, people started to turn to their local processors as a secure and reliable source of meat. Uh, but they're busy. Uh, a letter from our local processor here in Northwest Ohio. Uh, if you want to get an animal processed, you're looking after March and into, or excuse me, after November of this year and then to the 2021 year. So in summary, yeah, you know, I think there's some some optimism for the cattle market as we go through summer and fall and these plants get opened up. Pork and poultry, the logistics certainly makes its um, impact greater. Dairy segment back in the familiar territory. So what can we do? Well, we can eat more bacon. This is probably against what Emily said this morning. Uh, so I'll throw that disclaimer, drink more milk um, and, and help support those uh, animal industries that are struggling. Eat more, drink more, it's fine. <laughs>